Hi, it's Robin. I have here an EMI or ME tape by Thorn EMI, very famous publisher, a quality low noise, high output cassette for personal computer programs and data. And here it says it's the ME tape computer cassette C20. The letter C followed by a number was a common indicator on compact cassette tapes of how long they are, and that's a total length, so that's 10 minutes per side. It says here, use to record, save, computer programs or data. And there's the spine of it. And as you can tell, it's still sealed. And these blank computer cassettes were fairly common back in the early 80s, and I, I guess throughout the 80s, in these shorter lengths, which I suppose allowed them to be a bit cheaper. And also, people often wanted to just save a few programs per cassette because it was such a hassle to fast forward and rewind through them. So shorter lengths were fine, and sometimes allowed the actual tape to be a bit thicker, and therefore maybe a bit more reliable. Although I know a lot of people used 90 and even 120 minute cassettes, it was frowned upon for data storage, but that didn't stop a lot of you from playing dangerously. So this particular tape is one I've never owned before, and I got it thanks to a tip from viewer Edwardian T-Chest. I hear that this cassette has a program in it, actually not on the tape at all, but supposedly there is a program listing inside of here, which was really intriguing to me. Now, I found no evidence of this on the internet at all, apart from this comment from Edwardian T-Chess. So, I sure hope he's right. Specifically, he said it was the Thorn EMI C15 blank tapes, but I could not find one of those. So, I got this C20. I hope this has it too. And just look at the back side here. Selected for use with personal computers that link to a standard audio cassette player, including... The Sinclair ZX range, Acorn, Atom, and BBC Micro, Commodore, VIC-20, and PET, Commodore 64 not mentioned, Genie, NASCOM range, and Texas Instruments TI-99, I think, and many others. Interesting that the Commodore 64 doesn't get mentioned, so very likely this was from 1982, Earlier, or in mid-1982, the Commodore 64 hadn't yet arrived. So I'm almost certain that this tape is a full 40 years old, but still brand new in the wrap. And we're going to open it up and see if this program really is inside here, this program listing. Okay, so to open it, it looks like there's some sort of pull tab. What do you call those? A little ribbon stringy kind of thing. Oh, there we go. Pull tab. Oh, well, that kind of worked. Never really worked for me. All right. There's the plastic off. Oh, what does it smell like? Oh, it does smell like the 1980s. 1982 vintage. Okay, let's open this up and hope this is true. There's the cassette. So the cassette itself, nice green, white, and blue, points out the right protect tabs at the top. They're still intact. Gives the place for the program details, name and date, memory needed, etc. Well, inside one and two don't seem to be differentiated between. Tighten that up there. But that side one there, you can see it's remound. Ooh. A red leader. Hmm. Okay, but what I'm really interested in here, oh yeah, it was the TI-99 4A made in the UK. And what have we got here? EMI Computer Cassette C20. Okay, hey, let's read these helpful hints. I'll put a chapter index down below so you can jump ahead if you don't want to hear this. When saving, recording, or loading, reading, programs, study the following practical tips. Do read the appropriate section of the computer user manual when you have found the right position for the tone and volume controls 
Keep a note of the settings in a safe place for future reference. Make sure you don't try record on the leader the first 30 centimeters of the tape. It's red. As a general rule, a straightforward portable mono cassette is at least as satisfactory, if not better, than a more complex stereo one. I absolutely agree with that. The cheaper the tape deck, usually the better. For a variety of unplanned reasons, e.g. falter in the mains power supply, the information in the computer memory can be lost whilst you are working on a program. To avoid frustration, it's a good practice to periodically save the developing program so that the amount of work to be redone is minimized. Save, giving the program a name which indicates the date and time to ensure you keep track of the latest version and or note the name as a remark in the first program statement. If you have problems saving and loading programs or data which are not resolved by simple tone or volume control adjustments, check all the connections thoroughly, okay? If you still have problems, try saving with the output ear lead disconnected using a battery-driven recorder instead of uh, plugged into the AC mains, which can cause some extra interference, with the TV screen and computer power supply, if separate, further away, where there is less static, carpet or garments, on a different recorder. Borrow a friend's. These are actually okay tips. If you make a change to a tested working program, keep a copy of the old one until the new version is proved. That is, don't save over your old one. Similarly, to cater for unforeseen accidents, always keep an extra copy in a safe place of any program or data that is valuable. To stop programs or data being accidentally overwritten, press out the right protect tabs. There they are. If subsequent recording is required, cover the gap created above with adhesive tape. Okay, and is it? Oh, <laughs> I guess I should have looked in there. I was thinking there might be another flap there, but there isn't. But there it is. A fun program here. Try this fun program on your computer. Try saving on your Emmy Tape data computer cassette. And there it says for the VIC-20. Here's a listing. Oh, that's hard to get in focus. And a ZX81 listing. Oh, should we try both? So I'm super excited that these <laughs> that this is here. Okay, I'll grab the VIC-20. And oh, we got to do the ZX81 as well, eh? Let's give these a try. Okay, I've got my VIC-20 set up. And we're going to try and type in that program. Boy, is that ever small. I'll try to stick a blown up version of it up in the corner so you can follow along at home. And if I make any mistakes typing this in, you know the routine, yell really loud. Hopefully this won't take too long. 10, poke, 3, 6, 8, 7, 9. That sounds like setting the border color. 20. I'm going to use the question mark abbreviation. And as it says down at the bottom, to obtain heart symbol, press shift and the clear home key. And question mark is an abbreviation for print. Move the square using cursor controls. All right, line 40. Now press return. Line 50, input R string. So it's just waiting for any prompt. Input R string is just an easy way to make the computer wait. Print another clear screen. 70, let X equals 10. The lets are not necessary, but I will type them in. Let Y, it's just implied if you type a variable name and the equals sign, it knows you want to do an assignment. Some earlier basics required that. And actually, if we do type in the ZX81 version, it will require it as well. 90, poke, bracket, X plus Y, 102. Line 100, get a string. That gets a character. So the poke probably puts some sort of symbol on the screen. I don't know what 102 is, but we'll find out soon enough. Line 110. <laughs> this is dense. Let x equal x plus bracket a string equals character string 157 double closing brackets minus 
a string equals character string. I'm going to skip some of those spaces there. 29. So I think that line is using some Boolean logic to check for both cursor left and right and to move the square in the X position based on whether you're pressing those character keys or not. And line 20, let X equal X plus X is greater than 21 minus X is less than zero. And that is probably boundary checking the edges of the screen. Okay, line 130 looks like it's going to be moving in the Y direction. Y equal Y plus 22 times A string equals character string. 145 and subtract 22 times A string equals character string 17. So I've dealt with these before, but basically... If you write inside of these brackets, a string equals character string 145, it means this get a string will get a character from the keyboard. And if it's equal to character 145, then this whole clause is equal to minus one, which is true. And it multiplies by 22, which is the number of columns across the screen. So this evaluates to minus 22. So that has the effect of moving the square up the screen. And likewise down here, it's a minus 22 times minus one if character 17 is in a string. Minus one is true times 22, it becomes positive 22, so that's the effect of down. So it's probably character string up and down, and these are left and right up here. Okay, so that's line 130, almost done. Let y equal y plus 22 times bracket y is greater than 8164 minus 22 times y is less than 7680. And line 150, go to 90. Okay, well, let's move this over. And yes, I have my cassette deck ready here. And as they said, for a variety of unplanned reasons, the information in the computer memory can be lost while you're working on a program. So before I run it, let's save it. Okay, so I've got this cassette. I'm actually going to advance it here with my finger past that leader. What did it say? There's like 20 centimeters of it. Oh, yeah, there we go. There's some tape. Does it look good? Looks pretty good. All right, let's put it in. And we'll just type save Ami tape. I don't know. Nope, not comma eight. Just on its own. Save Ami tape. Press record and play on tape. Okay, here goes. Saving Ami tape. And it's ready. And the cassette stopped automatically. I'll just press stop to actually release it. And now it's saved on the cassette. Good for another 40 years. Here goes, we're gonna run it. I hope it works. Ooh, that blue on black doesn't look great. Move the square using cursor controls. Now press return. Okay, I'll press return. Oh, there it is. It's that checkerboard pattern. Okay, I'll try going up. Yay, it works. Right, down, and left. Does it have that boundary checking? Let's go to the edges of the screen. <laughs> Hard to see where I am. Oh, there we go.
All right. Hey, that was a fun program. I'm glad we typed it in. Should we type in the ZX81 version? Of course. I have to go find that thing. Let me set up my ZX81, or actually maybe my Timex Sinclair 1000. Be back in a moment. Okay, I've got my Sinclair ZX81 set up here. I don't know if I've ever shown this in a video before. Certainly shown my Timex Sinclair 1000, which is nearly identical. Maybe the only difference is that this has two kilobytes of RAM, and this only has one kilobyte of RAM. There might be some other minor differences I'm not aware of, but they're really nearly the same. But this is an NTSC model, so it, it was an official release, but for whatever reason, Sinclair partnered with Timex to uh, do a bigger push of their computers into North America and double the RAM. Okay, so let's try and type this program in here. Line 10, here we go. Print, shift, quote, move the black spot by pressing. You know what? Do you really want to watch me type all that in? Instructions. Okay, we get the idea. Line 10. You know what? I'm going to skip line 20, 30, and 40. Life's too short for that. 50. Input a string. Good. Enter. Line 60. Who knows? Maybe I don't even have enough RAM for, uh, <laughs> for those instructions. Okay, where's CLS? Oh, good. So this Sinclair basic only allows you to put one statement per line. Line 70. And like I was saying, it forces you to use the let command, but at least you only have to press the one button, L, and it fills in the rest for you. Let X equal 32. 80. Let Y equal 22. And the screen glitches each time I press enter. Part of how they made this computer super cheap, like I bought my first one, it was, uh, I think it was $99 Canadian. And that was amazing that there was a $100 computer. But one of the many cost savings, well, besides the terrible keyboard, lack of RAM, was that the CPU is actually drawing the screen as well, and it can't both process a new line and draw the screens. So when you press enter, it takes a break from drawing the screen to process your command, and the screen kind of bounces and flickers during that time. For a little while, it drops down to zero frames per second. Now here's one thing that the Sinclair has over that VIC-20 version. It has an actual plot command. Plot X, comma, Y. Don't have to do that poke. Okay, and here we go. This is going to be painful. Let X equal X plus bracket in key string. Where are you in key string? That's the thing. You can't just type in the command. You actually have to find the appropriate button somewhere on this keyboard. Oh, there it is. But it's down on the bottom. Maybe if I shift. Nope. Maybe if I hit function. And then I press in key. Yeah. <laughs> How long's it been since I played around with this? Okay, and we're pressing eight, but you see how there's a right arrow on there. But we're not gonna require people to shift, obviously. That would be too painful shift to get to the cursor keys. So instead, we're just going to have them press eight and then a closing parenthesis and then minus. But you can see the logic is just the same as the VIC-20, but it's using this in key. Okay, shift function in key. The VIC-20 got the character and then just compared the character. Instead, we're using this in key function over and over again. Equals, quote, Oh, the screen is bending a little there. I'm actually surprised how clean the screen was when I first hooked this up. It was so noisy. And I just wiggled everything around until it cleaned up pretty good. Okay, and a closing bracket. Oh, man. Okay, line 100. Line 110. You know, it feels like I've done two or three other episodes that are basically the same program, but I didn't actually know what 
<laughs> when I bought this cassette, I didn't even know if this typing program would be on it, never mind what it actually did or anything. So I'm doing it. Oh, that didn't work. X equals X plus X is less than zero. And another bracket minus bracket X. I'm not taking my time here. This is as fast as I can type on this thing. Okay, so that's doing the collision detection or the boundary checking for the X dimensions, the left and right. Okay, we're getting there. Line 120, halfway through the hard part. Let Y. They ever have like typing competitions for this keyboard? I bet there are some kids. Well, I know I got pretty fast at it when I used this thing every day back when. Oh, no. Nope. Y equals Y plus. You know, this could be like a speed run thing. See who can type in this program the fastest. Inky string equals quote. Okay, seven is for the up. Quote, and the marketing tried to spin this keyboard, uh, this entry, this method of keyboard entry as a good thing. Because, you know, you don't have to type in the whole commands. It's so much better than a VIC-20. You know, a VIC-20 with an actual proper keyboard on it. It's kind of a mismatch that the VIC-20 had uh, such a good keyboard for the time. And yet, you know, the... The video chip was kind of so low resolution, uh, and that way it seemed like a toy. Uh, and the lack of RAM. Well, I mean, it's still way better than this thing. VIC-20's better, but hey, this was my first computer, actually. the This was my first computer, the Sinclair 1000, and I still love the thing. Okay, just keep going a little bit longer, old computer. It's almost like smelling kind of funny, like it's getting too warm here. Oh, no. Let y equal y plus y less than zero minus, and this is again the uh, boundary checking for the screen, y is greater than 43. Ooh! Line 140. It's actually very similar to the VIC-20 implementation, like. Okay, there's the whole program. Oh, I forgot to put that on there. I could have put that there the whole time, eh? Okay, I think we've got the whole thing typed in. I don't actually have my cassette deck for this set up, and I don't think it's working. Anyway, we are just going to risk it. I bring some Commodore security out, just in case that helps us. And here we go. Let's hope it works. I press the run button and enter. Instructions. Yes. Okay. And it's just waiting for us to press a key. And there's a dot. And press eight. Yay. And down. <laughs> and left. Go, 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 and up. Up, 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 up. All the directions work. Ooh, it's glitching out. That just happens sometimes. I think it's just having trouble processing the input and in the program. And cursor right. So it's kind of offset there or something, but... That is just some sort of geometric pattern for you. There it is. Yeah, you know what? I'm realizing I've I've made this same episode about three times already before. <laughs> but I, I didn't know what I was getting into. It was just this is what was on that J card, but it, this this just wasn't documented at all. Like I searched and searched online trying to find this. Uh the J card, or just to find out what this program was. And there it is. Okay, and now we know.
All right, let's put that back in the J card. Okay, there we go. There's the Emmy Tape Computer Cassette C20 with type in programs. I think it's the only computer cassette that I own that instead of having a program on the cassette, it has the program listed in the J card. That's really cool. Thank you very much to Duarte and T-Chest for bringing that to my attention. Okay, thank you to my patrons for their support. Thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you next time. When I was ten, I became obsessed with video games and the like I dreamed of Donkey Kong, Pong and then Space Invaders through the night At school we had a Commodore